Hi. I have, hi, I have such funny glasses. I have to say that's a little joke because um, that I can see the screen uh, in a better way. And um, so not my normal glasses look like that. And um, I can also speak in this way um, that you are not in, uh, infected. Um, okay. Very good. So I can speak this way. Okay. How's that? We can do this. And every once in a while, I'll just pull this up and kind of, how's that? <laughs> Welcome <Yeah>. everyone <laughs> to uh, Michael Chekhov Master's Talk, episode three on the higher ego with myself, Lisa Dalton of the National Michael Chekhov Association and my dear colleague. I'm Jörg Andres from Berlin, Michael Chekhov International Academy. And we have, uh, again, our guest, Ophir. Ophir, Duren, can you say short? You are in Tel Aviv, is that right? I'm in, I'm in Israel, near Tel Aviv. Yeah, studied with uh, both Jorg and Lisa. That's it, I'm waiting for this talk. Okay, so we have had two previous videos on the topic of the higher ego. And from our perspective, this concept of the higher ego is one of the most singularly important aspects of Michael Chekhov's work. And it has applications and usefulness and the ability to empower artists of all kinds, indeed, in fact, human beings of all kinds. And today, we're going to really look at how this higher ego does apply out in the world the question of its impact on the relationship between the artist and society and move into the discussion about the nature of the ideal actor of the future and how cultivating and training awareness of the higher ego will help us manifest and, you know, it's my belief that right now, this is that future that we need to be that higher actor for. So, Jorg, would you like to launch into some of your thoughts? To begin that in this direction, this talk, um, it is sometimes, of course, a question, um, where can I see the check of acting? In which theater is presenting this new way of Chekhov acting. And when it is not seen, then okay, what is it worth? What is our work for? And this question, of course, um, is very, on one hand, very important, but on the other hand, it is quite clear the way how one act with the check of technique is not a style. It's not a style itself. So one can't see it in the way as one can see um, uh, like uh, in the dance, a buto dance uh, separate from a ballet or something like that. And the deeper point is from my understanding that there is a not so much explored field in this Chekhov technique. And this field is just this field with the living forces where we are um, getting, where we're getting our life from. And there is in this field is also the creative imagination. And in this from that field on, it is also to reach out to the higher ego, if you can reach out to that. That's a kind of a sound like a mystery, Chekhov speaks about also that it sounds sometimes like a mystery with that. And he gives them this nice um, exercises how to explore um, it in a way that you get a sense, a trusting that there is something what is not only your daily life, 
or some people call it also lower ego. And uh, also to make that circle mm, more complete in a way, when he speaks about the higher ego, he comes also to that point um, beside three others that it is um, helping to find out more about that distinguishing between good and evil. And when we go to the composition analysis and this um, way to try to understand the play, we meet this theme again to find out what is there, the power of good and evil in the play. And I think this is one of the important points what leads then all together Maybe I'm a little bit too fast with all my thoughts. What leads all together then, that we, through the training, through the training, we will also develop um, new senses. And so we can maybe also develop through the training this sense for good and evil, the sense what we may need also in our life, to distinguish between the good powers and the more evil powers. And this is not easy. It's very difficult. Because the world can't be without the so-called evil powers. And then always the question is, what is the evil? What is the good? And this is a wide, wide philosophical discussion. But when we go from the point of view of acting to understand the characters, as Chekhov is suggesting it, to understand how is the power of the good and the power of the evil working in a character, how is this uh, field of this powers um, in the, in the weaving in the play and all that um, questions, this can give us to develop the possibility to develop a sense for it. Another sense what Chekhov is speaking about is a sense of truth, artistic truth. But maybe when we develop um, artistic truth, we also develop a sense, I mean a sense for artistic truth, we maybe we develop also a sense for other truths and untruths. From that point of view, I think the Chekhov technique is a very, very interesting field also for our time, because the training itself is also transforming the actor itself and not only his way of acting. And for the way of acting, there we will, I think we will come later to it, um, to a sub, very subtle point. What is there the moment, what we could look even on stage when we get this different way of acting? How, how can we sense something? What maybe, maybe is different especially when we have our um, modern theater. So that's a very, very wide circling around many points and many themes. But in the end, the relationship of the actor to oneself is one of the basic things. And this relationship and the developing of the creative imagination this has to do with the higher ego. This has to do with the creative individuality. What is not my daily life, personality, what I need, what is not um, to say anything against it. It's um, wonderful. And this daily life um, personality want in the creative way is 
and Chekhov speaks about that also, is going more to the kind of a logic or um, more, uh, Chekhov says, a materialistic um, understanding of the world and making all um, just functioned one into the other. And the creative ego is opening up to this with a creative imagination, opening up to the unseen beyond the visible. So now we could go a next circle, but I give it for a moment to Lisa. I think you have some um, more specific thoughts to that, what I just gave. <laughs> Uh, you gave us a just sort of a, a great outline for uh, for you know this entire talk, and so what I'm feeling called to address specifically is the aspect that you referenced regarding good and evil, and I'd like to talk about uh, utilizing again the law of triplicity of Mr. Chekhov, which is one of his good things among so many. Um, uh, to look at the sources of evil, sometimes we call conflict, and uh, we have three sources. We have that evil from inside, and we have evil or conflict coming from between, sort of person to person, and then we have it coming from the outside. Uh, so humanity against nature or the gods. and. Uh, and so in the same way that we are um, able to look at those three questions, uh, where is the evil coming from and uh, where is the, what is the good, what is the evil, in each of these three areas that we would ask for character, that we would ask for the play as an overall construct, where is the good and evil in the... Um, idea of the play that we're bringing forward to the audience, we are through our higher ego going to ultimately make those kinds of decisions based on what it is that we want to communicate with the audience. And, uh, and this goes to a question where Michael Chekhov says that through developing our higher ego, we ultimately will not only be able to identify what truly we need to bring forward in our performance, in our production per se, a specific production, uh, but within any given moment or any given show of that, any given day that we are giving that show, we will develop the intuition, uh, is the word I'm going to use, uh, to bring nuances to our performance that will meet the audience and each individual member of the audience in a unique way and in a way that their higher self needs at that particular moment. And that I will talk more about in, uh, I think we'll talk more about that later. That to me, developing that ability is absolutely the actor of the future that we must activate now. So what I want to look at is some of the evils that the higher ego comes up against. Um, that blocks us from really embracing the higher ego and uh, though and and if we again go to the first question we're looking at our self as a human being then we see that within us we have several evils that can arise that block our higher self from expressing itself and the one that Mr. Chekhov very blatantly <laughs> speaks, he's in your lower critical uh, intellect, he says murders, your, uh, murders you, murders your higher creative self. So all the things that inhibit the artist from within, 
those vulnerabilities of their personality, their fears, their anxieties, their failure to believe in themselves uh, become evil forces which block the higher self and can be healed and transformed through focusing and concentrating on this sense of the higher self. So all the work in Michael Chekhov's uh, technique goes to help heal the wounds that live within you, the personal artist, that may be forces of evil that are blocking your highest creative self from expression and from um, incorporation, right? From living fully in your corporal corporality, in your body. And we have different aspects of that. We can say those conflicts can live in the thinking forces, they can live in the feeling forces, and they can live in the will forces. And so it's an invitation to you to ask yourself in, uh, in what way might my thoughts be perhaps critical. Uh, if they're critical to yourself, then it's very possible that they're moving into the second realm, which is leading to criticality between you and the outer world, between you and partners. And if you are, and so whether it manifests mostly as self-criticism, lowering your self-esteem, making you prone to depression in the feeling forces and making you paralyzed then in the will forces. Uh, these thoughts can travel affecting the others. And you can also have within yourself a physical and the will force. You could have, for example, just a lack of familiarity with a particular uh, impulse. For example, if you were never uh, given a role model of someone with some self-discipline, then you may not have self-discipline and you may find yourself wanting to do many things, wanting to train yourself, wanting to do those exercises, to do that practice, to do that visualization and not doing it. And that would be uh, evil, you could say, coming through an undeveloped will force. And so, the high, again, the higher ego will help you with that because it uh, and the and the whole technique will help you learn what a will force is and help restore to your entire repertoire of human daily energies a strong will force and if you enter your practice with a commitment through your higher ego to bring this kind of balance to yourself, to utilize your higher self and this practice to engage the will force, to balance your feeling forces and to create a sense of enthusiasm rather than criticism in your thinking forces, you will begin to be able to perform in on stage and in film your artist will be able to express itself more fully and so with that process one of the the central concepts that's going to build that is this sense of love that we activate through the heart forces and through the ideal artistic center because the love when it radiates up into your thinking forces with the help of that higher self, transforms it into its ability to perceive beauty, its ability to, uh, to become curious. And when you can become curious and say, rather than, oh, I don't like that, but to say, oh, that's interesting. I'm curious what that's like curious what that means. If we can awaken that curiosity and interest in the thinking force, it will kill that criticality. And if we can activate that love in the feeling force, it will 
transform any fear that's living there. And when we get that love to radiate down into the will force, we can find courage uh, rather than being paralyzed, that, uh, uh, that sense of uh, disinterest floats down or drifts down or presses down into the will force and turns us into being bored and apathetic. So that interest, that love, and that enthusiasm to want to take action and the courage to take action can all be developed through the higher ego practices. And then, and those are the self-development, the means to overcoming the evils within you through the higher ego. Then we look at this, the evils that come from between. Uh, so, and, and just regarding that for, for within, that also includes, of course, the attitudes and criticism toward our character. Uh, when, if we have a judgment about our character that it will block us from inviting the higher ego to come in and show us a loving, powerful, creative, dynamic way to perform it. So going to the higher ego asking how can I love this character will help build your, your inner attitude toward the character, which is the same as the relationship between another human being. So we think of that same all those same things that we're working on within ourselves <clears throat> have to do with our attitude toward the other person. And looking at and understanding that the other has their own thinking, feeling, and willing forces, their own inner battles uh, between good and evil. And so being able to open through the higher ego, it opens us to compassion. It allows us to have compassion both for our character and for the other people that we work with. And applying again the feeling of beauty, Mr. Chekhov talks about even if you don't like that person to find something you can appreciate, maybe perhaps the shape of their eyebrow. And this understanding the higher ego in relationship to the other expands to that one-on-one -on -one relationship that we have with the audience, any given member of the audience. So then we can expand it out into our using our higher self to cultivate uh, the soul and spirit of the character and to honor, respect, and relate to the soul and spirit of each human being with whom we encounter. In the application for our acting, for the construct of the good and evil forces of the play, uh, we have the ability to use the higher ego to really sense who, which character is a plus and which character is a minus in our relationship. So which characters or events or moments are evil to our character and which ones are good. And understanding this is going to really give us a more inspired performance. And one place that you can super see that is you can see in Michael Chekhov's clip for uh, his Oscar nomination in Spellbound, at the very beginning of it, he comes into his home and there are police officers there and Ingrid Bergman's there. And there's a variety of people there. And you can see very clearly in how he relates to each individual exactly whether he considers this person an evil in uh, an evil force in his own personal objective or uh, a good force and it continues at into the scenes just between Gregory Peck and himself. You can see through his acting, if you're looking for it, all the different ways in which Mr. Chekhov is expressing his perception of evil in Gregory Peck's character and you can see when it shifts, when it turns and when he becomes an ally to Gregory Peck and uh, when the three 
um, Ingrid Bergman, Gregory Peck, and Michael Chekhov all join forces toward the external force of evil, which in this case uh, is that um, uh, a murder which, which occurred, which Gregory Peck did not commit. So, uh, and that leads to that third uh, situation, which is the evil coming from the outside. And there are many different evils that the artist faces coming from the outside. Number one, right now, uh, in this age of a pandemic, we artists have been deemed inessential. We have been deemed non-essential. We have been shut down from our role. And yet, who is the first who are the first people that the world turns to? It's us. I don't know if anybody saw that global event with, um, w with uh, Lady Gaga the other night. Um, artists from all over the world on three uh, networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, created a, an amazing concert. But, you know, and that the world is watching the world is turning to the online sources and they're turning to actors they're turning to artists and the art galleries are doing visual tours of their programs there's dance classes online there are painting classes online there are singing classes musical lessons all online and a uh, bunch of acting classes all going online and performances the national theater live airing their performances on youtube at national theater at home so the world is demanding entertainment and so that's an important thing for us to understand that the demand for our art is constant and it's part of the human spirit and it feeds the human soul. Through our higher self, we can engage those feelings of beauty and make friends with the current conditions. We face the evils of underfunding. We face the evils of disrespect. We have uh, a culture that, as I said, has officially and legally deemed entertainment as an, a non-essential act uh, of survival. And we can overcome this. And our higher ego is the thing that can give us the answers to that. So it, what we are able to think of in our everyday logic forces is one small tiny tiny percent of what is possible now einstein thought he was operating at eight percent of his potential and it's when we engage the higher ego we have bursts of happy moments where this incredible flame of inspiration sparks and ignites a truth, this truth that Jorg was speaking of, it becomes palpable by everyone around, the artist and the spectator, experience those sparks. It sparks in the artist and it ignites the spectator. And that is what we can do now with through the higher ego, we can continue to work to build the skill set and the power to be able to look at an audience who maybe, maybe when we get back on our stages, those audience members are going to be seated six feet away from each other, perhaps. And instead of sitting right next to a person breathing with you in the audience, the audience may feel very isolated there. And this, uh, we've all played to small houses and we know that the ability to build atmosphere can sometimes be 
uh, shortened by an inner evil that the artist has when they think, oh, it's a small house. I don't have very much uh, audience. It's not going to be good. And so we don't allow it to be good. But the Chekhov actor, through their higher self, can see the beauty of this perfect size of the audience in the perfect space. And the Chekhov actor is absolutely capable of creating an experience for an individual sitting 10 feet away from another individual and, uh, and give them an experience of being absolutely united, absolutely one. And that is the central uh, task of the higher self, which is to unite, to unite. So I'm going to pause there and kick it over to Jorg. <laughs> Hi, hi, Lisa. That was a very much, very much in, in one um, um, ball, in one <laughs> world. And um, maybe we can um, ask Ophir that he can um, find out of our both um, statements a kind of a question. So I give you a moment, uh, Ophir, for that. If I understood you right, Lisa, um, I don't know. I, I'm fully agreeing that um, there is a very great and very important power in all the artists to build up the future. Uh, as much as I agree with that thought, um, as much I um, have to say I disagree <laughs> with that, um, wonderful um, events and all that um, online art and all that um, things. Um, I think there it needs to study it really very, very carefully to see what really happens. Because these things are, um, from my understanding, in the direction of um, what does it do to the audience, to the people? Um, I feel this is something just what goes to the opposite, um, as that what one wants with um, the Chekhov technique itself, let's say, especially in a theater. But maybe this is another topic, and we have to um, maybe find a way to discuss this topic um, later. So, Ophir, um, is there a point you would? Um, yes, thank you, first of all. Um, I, I, have, I had a thought when you both talked. Um, maybe it's a simple of a question, but that's I, what I feel I need. Um, if I have those kinds of thoughts, I mean, Chekhov talked about the, the, the actor of the future and that he don't need, that he won't be needing directors and he won't be needing uh, producers and the actor is the art and that's what we need. If I have those kinds of thoughts, like um, why should I, why should I bother to go to auditions? Why should I bother to um, write another play? Why should I um, do a war to be on the stage? And it's only for 20 people. And, may and maybe the 90% um, uh, the odds that this play that I'm writing now will not be on the stage. So how can I specifically um, with some kind, I don't know, maybe with a tool or maybe with something else that you will recommend, um, invite my higher ego um, to lift me with those thoughts? Jorg, do you want to take that up? <laughs> you, you push the ball to me. I um, did. That's, that's the <laughs> classic Chekhov ball toss. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, of course, um, 
uh, a question what is touching um, many people, especially also in this time now. Uh, it has also to do um, to make a living from the art. Uh, all these difficult um, problems are in this question involved. Um, the, the point even for, for an actor maybe is the same as it was for many of artists in the past that one is on one hand very much alone um, very much someone who has to find its own way and nobody in this way is waiting for you just waiting ah oh, here you are i've waited hundreds of years for you that you come with your individual task and individual understanding of life I think this is one um, question, uh, what is not easy to answer and not to answer in abstract words. It is to answer only by the individuality. What is it, what makes me open and what leads me to the point to be an artist, to become an artist, to try to live with that as far as I can. This question, nobody can answer, only oneself, everybody for oneself. If I understood you right, Ophir, I think to answer this question for oneself, this is a question of the higher ego. Um, can I sense something? What what it makes it worse for me to follow these streams instead of that, what I maybe could also in a different way in life to get satisfied by the outer world. It is very, very difficult to answer. Yeah. And I don't want to say that it is, um, um, that it is everybody's um, task. It's a big, big question of the society. And the, as I understood Chekhov in, the, in this phrase, what he says is that the actor of the future will, I speak it out freely now, will give back to the human being the understanding of the human being. I think this is just a question. How how do we understand our human beings? How do we understand our society? How do we understand all these three fields? The field of the state, the field of the rights, and the field of the economy. How do we understand all that things um, from the point of view of the human being and of the um, unity of human being and earth? This is, I think, just a question. And this goes very, very wide on one hand, but on the other hand, very deep to everybody itself. And we can, we can as free individualities, and everybody knows how hard it is to become a free individuality in our society. We can, as free individualities, connect in a different way and not in the way of an abstract we. We can connect in the way, and I think this idea is so fantastic from Chekhov, as he suggested how an ensemble is built up through the individuals. This is a way how we can work together. And it needs something, it needs something. And maybe that's also the, the reason why we have this talk here on. I don't know if that is any, in any case helpful, I don't know. Um, and I, I love the question because I think every artist today who is not in some sort of uh, state supported 100% state supported you're guaranteed to be 
uh, an artist and be paid and make a living off of it for the rest of your life. So anywhere in the world where that's not happening, you have artists who are struggling with this, uh, as I was talking before, it's sort of a force of evil from society that uh, the industry really requires that you battle for the right to express your art. And uh, it, it brings me to, uh, to the question of the focal points. And, um, and I know a number of you have, have the, the playbook. And on page 72, uh, there's this discussion of focal points. And on that focal points, uh, the initial use of it is for where the character is looking. Is the character looking at their own body? Are they looking at their partner? Are they looking in the environment? Are they trying to remember something uh, in their inner life, an inner non-present image? Or are they uh, having no image in, in that fifth circle? When we apply those, expand that concept to the artist's life, uh, then we look at the artist having, living these five circles at once themselves as the character, they're playing the character, who is an actor, who is an artist, who is a human being, who is a spiritual being. And those five circles that spiritual being encompasses everything then the moment that you are delivering that line you are a spiritual being in the moment you're delivering that line you are a human being and in that human realm you have families you have a body to feed you have a body to exercise you have a rent to pay you have to purchase groceries, you have to generate an income, you have to stay healthy, and you have relationships. And then within that, you're an artist who is cultivating their art, writing a new script, taking a new acting class, getting headshots, trying to go to auditions. And within that, then you're the actor who is trying to decide whether to use expanding, contracting here, whether to use a, what psychological gesture for this moment, this character. And then while you're doing that, you are the character with the psychological gesture and the personal atmosphere all living at once. The, the trick to focal points, whether it's in performance or whether it's as a spiritual human being is understanding your deepest truth about what you need in any given moment. And it's an interesting thing, for example, in this fourth circle of the, the social self, uh, we could we could look at the whole world and say the whole social world as one is needing to pull itself away from these uh, smaller you know the tasks and the jobs and everything else and and looking at an entire social sphere and so we have to think in terms of the larger community we have to place the community as a whole because if i get sick maybe it's not going to affect me that much but if i walk down the street i may infect 100 people who may die so i have an obligation uh and and there is uh the i need to understand what is more important to me uh, defining my own creative individuality and saying, I don't give a shit. I'm going to walk down the street. I'm going to cough in someone's face. Doesn't matter whether I'm sick or not. I need to walk. And so our artist may say that if, if you're working in a Starbucks, your inner artist may say, you know what? I don't care whether you need to pay the rent. 
I need to act. And that may be true. Uh, you may be bouncing your children on your lap and your artist, if it doesn't get enough attention, may see, say, I need to, I need, I am a child of yours too. I need to be fed. And when that artistic impulse absolutely demands that you attend to it, it will turn if you don't honor it. Uh, it, it will, the pain of not being able to express your artistic impulse will manifest in some way, in the illness, in accidents, in difficult relationship situations, because it is a vital, natural part of your spirit. And if it weren't in your spirit, then this struggle of having to fight to get the opportunity to express it would not be so painful. So my bottom line there is that not, no single artist is forced to engage in the social requirements of getting employed as an actor. You don't have to do those auditions. You really don't. Uh, you don't have to make that new headshot. You don't have to go out and fight the battle to get the opportunity to work. But there are consequences if you don't. And so what you will find is you do need to find some means of expression for your art. And it doesn't mean you have to be a professional at it. You will find, as Jorg said, you'll need to find an ensemble because all of our theater performances, all our acting, all acting is an ensemble event. It is an ensemble with your creative self, with your director, even if it's you, with your playwright, even if it's you, and always, always with your audience. And that's where it's not just you. It can't be just you. It requires another living human being. And so your art may be expressed just between you and your child sitting on your lap and by engaging. So there may be a time when it's important for you to tend to the rest of your life or tend to your spirituality, tend to your health, tend to paying the rent. But your higher self will find a way, if you ask it, it will find a way to bring your artistic capabilities into those practical tasks. So all that to come around to, if you do choose to engage in the battle, be an artistic person, uh, find the artistic pathway into the audition, find the artistic pathway to the self-promotion, find the artistic pathway into all the drudgeries, the difficulties, the evils of the professional process. Apply the feeling of beauty and try to make all of the job generating tasks um, into works of art. And that's where the higher ego, again, responds to you leading it by questions. So the higher ego is always responsive if you ask it, if you invite it. Mr. Chekhov says the lower ego will barge in. It is a full-grown, fully empowered, um, fully developed force. And it doesn't need to be invited. It will charge in and offer its own thoughts of desires and feelings. But the higher ego must be invited. And the questions that you ask are the means to opening Mr. Chekhov says it, um, uh, it let me quote this um, through your um, where is it your leading questions open a little door to release our great prisoner 
And when you open that door, our great prisoner, the higher ego, escapes from prison and enters our work and begins to kindle uh, our creative um, powers. And so it can do that 24 hours a day in any given field of your life. So, uh, and Jorg, I want to I want to mention I'm so glad you're you uh, disagree with me um, because I'm not fully sure you understood what I was saying. What I was saying uh, is that the demand the the so the global social demand for artists has been uh apparent and the only way that they can get to artists right now is through the online means and so they're accepting that and the artists are offering it online because artists need to make offers and because audiences need to be need that entertainment and contact with art i don't think i agree if i understood you correctly i agree that this medium is a very poor very very poor second uh it is not ideal in any way for the performer because our greatest power is the person-to-person -person contact where we really can um, make a, uh, a a unification. We can unify uh, the and heal, uplift, and educate in person with that personal exchange. And I think after this, the demand for a live human exchange is going to increase, uh, and and that's where the Chekhov trained artist is going to be able to to meet uh, I believe meet the needs on a higher level uh, which is what I think you were speaking about earlier I also um, want to say that um, I, I do though feel that there might be something that the Chekhov technique could bring to online communication mm. Uh, and I'd like to see if we can find a way to develop our radiation so strong that it goes, uh, that it can improve the richness of connection through the, uh, through the cosmic sphere, not through the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, maybe I didn't, um, fully understand, uh, what, what you meant. And when you say it in this way. This is um, quite clear. Uh, there is something what I got until now. I'm doing um, such things here. Yeah? I'm also working now with that media and I give such trying out um, to teach through that what is really, um, really um, an experience and I try to understand in this process what really happens there what is the bit the part of that what we could say it's a good one in it and on the other hand just uh, i try to understand really what is it doing to someone and especially to someone who is not aware of it and when one is taking it as I don't know, as the real, as a kind of a real, um, then it is, from my understanding, just um, creating the opposite of that. What is the aim of the actor of the future? And this, um, we can leave it in this um, level. I don't want to uh, go uh, now word by word, what, what is a meaning of, of that what you said and um, um, the last statement i can very much agree with um so let's talk more about the vision of the theater of the future and the actor uh jorg tell us more about what what is that if someone said to you what does it mean what does the theater of the future mean or what does it mean to train to be an actor what, you know, what is that? It has to do with this 
field in which one is working to work not only in the physical area, not only in that um, field of the outside um, acting, the, the businesses and all um, the set to the stage and the lighting and the music and what is there. It has to do also what is in each tool of the Chekhov technique involved and this is how it is. So for instance, atmosphere. Atmosphere goes beyond that what is a physical thing. And of course, when we arrange some physical objects in a, in a room, then they create also a kind of an atmosphere. The important point is that also the actor actively is creating something what is with his tools um, tangible and you can feel it, but it's not um, visible. It's not um, in this way uh, so, um, so, so in, a, in a physical way there. And the other is what we have discussed or what you described wonderful with the good and evil. It is also, can the actor give to the audience through this work, through the understanding and looking to that field of good and evil, also a sensation and understanding of that good and evil through a play. Can he give something what is going beyond that what the story itself is? Everybody tries that, I know. And also the other field is from how it is affecting with the feelings or in uh, the, the audience, how is the audience affected by the feelings, by the emotions, by the sensations. And this is a very subtle field. And of course, with this media now, very difficult to <laughs> discuss. Um, because we can't uh, sense it so much through that um, cameras. But there is a wide field um, to study when we are working together. What is it? What is always sensible? I don't have another word, sorry for that. What is always sensible, but it is not visible. It is always hear able, but it is not sad. It is always feel able, but it was not in this emotions I have seen. Um, what is that? What is always a step beyond that? What is in the field of the living forces? And what is as an effect to build, help to build in the field of the living forces something healthy through a performance. It doesn't mean that there is not the devil possible to act, that's great. But it means altogether is a performance healthy in the end. Does it give some new power in the field of living powers? That's a field of the a performance in one direction. And for the actor it is um, there is this nice phrase Chekhov uh, gives, and I think this is really, um, you already have discussed it, that is a topic also with a higher ego, from which point of view can one realize that this is the actor of the future must not only find another attitude towards his physical body and voice, but to his whole existence on the stage. In the sense that the actor as an artist must more than anyone else enlarge his own being by the means of his profession. 
is this is really um, a very, very um, important moment, I think, that's very um, deep thing. And to become aware of it, what leads to the training and what leads also then on stage, how it is in the acting. Chekhov says, I mean, the actor must enlarge himself in a very concrete way, even to having quite a different feeling in space. His kind of thinking must be different. His feelings must be different kind. His feeling of his body and voice, the attitude to the settings, all must be enlarged. The air around the theater, the air around the theater must be air. That's a very interesting sentence. So, and this leads then in all the things to the how. And how is with which intention, with which thinking, with this, which also feelings enlarged extended, everything is done. This is what is the hard work for the actor, at least for the artist in our time, in general. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, or one of the things I want to expand upon that beautiful answer, Jörg, thank you. <clears throat> when Michael Chekhov was teaching in uh, Latvia and Lithuania, he offered a series of images based on the goblet and this uh, goblet image ultimately wound up in lessons to the teacher looking like a, a martini glass um, with very little explanation. As he was moving westward from teaching in the 1920s, late 20s, and uh, early 1930s in Eastern Europe, and then moving uh, to England and to the United States. Uh, but it seems it happened almost immediately upon uh, his transition from teaching in his own native language of Russian into teaching in English. Uh, he, he removed many of the very powerful elements of this image of the goblet. So the goblet literally was round in the images in, uh, in Latvia and Lithuania, and it included an entire upper field. And in that upper field, he had uh, a field of inspiration of star beings and uh, it's these, the, this sphere of uh, beings, artistic beings, and a central star, your star, <clears throat> up above it. And he shows how when we, we build the foundation of our goblet, uh, well, we come into the world with that. That's, that's who we are. <clears throat> and through practicing these tools that are here, we build the stem and it it grows upright in that it expands upright and we build the stem and then when we use the tools for a particular character a particular situation we use this specific psychological gesture this specific um, center imaginary body uh, that that specific process is fed by these beings that are these images, these sparkling spirit lights, and he's got them as little teeny yellow um, dark flames, little yellow flames of inspiration. And he shows how they come down when we invite them, this invitation to the higher self to come fill up this goblet. Uh, and per, And when it does, it fills the goblet and it permeates and he shows how all of the 
the outline of the goblet lights up, begins to glow with this yellow light mm -hmm. glow, and uh, and it permeates down into into our stem and makes that stronger, and it filters into our foundation, which makes our foundation deeper. Mm -hmm. And and in that process, it starts to radiate and it flows back up to the higher self and to these beings in our sphere of, of the higher self and makes them stronger. It's like food for them when we express this creative self. So we have this symbiotic relationship uh, where we feed through our art. We literally feed the higher spheres and that uh, when we when we think about the actor of the future which is now i believe uh, who we want to be now are people who recognize that the impulse that jorg was speaking of of uh of health that we everything we do should bring a sense of health and strength it should uplift the human being and when the human being is uplifted and when we are in that process we are also uplifting the cosmic beings we are bringing a greater spiritual force on all levels the invisible the unseen uh larger spiritual world as well as our own creative spirit and each time we do that if we if we like this if we want this idea then we would adapt and learn as many uh, of these tools and we would want to master them each one as fully as we possibly could and the more we can master each individual element, the stronger it can feed into these states of happiness and these states of happiness on the stage, the states of inspiration will, again, ra they radiate out and they create um, a global atmosphere that is lighter, filled with more truth, and when we can express truths, when we can express uh, artistic evil, it's like we pull it out of the earth's atmosphere and transform it with love. So the more love we can bring, the more revelation of the conflict between good and evil that we can bring forward and reveal to our audiences in a way that leaves them uplifted and inspired not less than it leaves them with this uplift that Jorg was really speaking about beautifully then we're really able to move forward and we could in fact if we were trained in all the elements of the technique including the compositional elements and a real sense of ensemble we could in fact create this actor driven theater that doesn't need a playwright that doesn't need an author doesn't need a director doesn't need a designer we would we the artist would be able to create all of that not that i want to erase those positions but if we can imagine that you have an entire ensemble who's willing to to contribute fully to all of those you can then create with much less money, with much less technology. You can deliver uh, uh, with uh, you know, a much smaller ensemble if that's what you have. So those are some, some thoughts. I did want to answer one question, which was um, about the book. Uh, the book that uh, I have is the Michael Chekhov Technique Playbook, and it's available uh, when a person studies with me for a big discount, but it is available for uh, <laughs> expensively on Amazon. Um, uh, Lisa, if yeah. if you if you can give me the permission to share screen, I can show the image of the goblet. Uh... There, there we go. 
Uh, can you see that? that? That's it. He has a series, and this is uh, figure three and figure four. Do you also have figure five? Yeah. Yes. Great. And you see that star up there, and you see, you can see the the uh, radiating elements uh, of the goblet form there. And is there a is that earlier image one or two with the go, the little stars coming down? Earlier. Oh, there I, I see there, there there. Uh, yes, there's the single your star, and then there's the little beings up there. Yeah. Great. Here they are coming down. <laughs> Thank you, up here. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, not the right moment, but uh, the time is over <laughs> on, <laughs> on on one hand, and there is uh, this is a new the topic I think um, to speak about that what it means in this relationship to the um, what what is in the goblet um, with a let's say with a more um, the spiritual relationship and the physical relationship and the uh, realistic work with that when we remember the, the phrase from um, the check of that the actor of the future we learn to have a full spiritual business and that the actor will know how to handle this spirit very detailed and very concrete um, then we could think, um, yeah, how we can manage it. What is it? This is a question. How can we understand that? I think that could be another topic for a talk, for an exchange. But it is quite clear what you also said. Um, it sounds like an ideal on one hand. On the other hand, it is just there. It is just there whenever we have the possibility to work together in real. Something in this, what you described, always is happening when we work with a, a check of tools. Maybe it's not this 100% fulfillment, but in any of that work I have involved with, there were just the element in it, what you described. It brings some healthiness, it gives for the audience as well as for the actors. It gives a different understanding about themselves and a different feeling for them about themselves. And it creates another awareness to the world around. What hopefully leads also to understand more and more what is beyond the outside. Everybody has known, I think now, or everybody knows now, who is responsible for our life? Who is responsible for it? It's a human being itself. Nobody from outside will help anymore. And the big question is, who is leading the human being to it, to this, in this responsibility, to the earth, and to the nature and to himself, herself. Uh, this only can be uh, free individuality and this free individuality is not only the physical person. It needs a deeper understanding and higher ideas, different ideas and a different understanding of the individuality of the others. Thank you, Jorg. I think that might be some uh, good words to start to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I really appreciate what you've brought forward. And Jorg, anything you want to say as we wrap up this third of the series on Higher Ego? I just want to say thank you. And um, this is a term that it's always uh, somehow up here and we don't know exactly, I don't know exactly always how to approach it and from where to attack and from where to talk about it. 
And this is uh, something that gave me a lot to think about um, and some security uh, to do it with my uh, students. Excellent. That is exactly why, <laughs> why we're hoping to offer it to you. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll sign off now. Thank you. Thank you. If you like, we see you next Monday.